We're talking Indiana Hoosiers football on the Our Lads Football Network. I'm Greg DePama. Thanks for tuning in as for the very first time ever in my 25 plus year broadcasting career, I am talking Indiana Hoosiers football with a special guest who covers the Indiana Hoosiers uh, for the Hoosiers. Actually, it's the Locked on Hoosiers podcast. Uh, and uh, you can check out, of course, the Lockdown Network, uh, Jacob Goins. Jacob, uh, good to have you talking about football. And I know we've been trying to put this together since the beginning of the season, but that just shows you uh, that, in a way, this is not too surprising that Indiana is off to a great start with the coach and the quarterback and everything else. You know, the schedule's been nice, uh, but still, it's, it's an awesome start to the season. Oh, it's been great, and I appreciate you having me on. And yeah, it's just been so busy with covering football every single week. And, you know, normally in Bloomington, we give up on that about a month into the season, and it's like, <laughs> ah, you know, basketball is right around the corner. But what's been great is we're blessed to be talking about both. We're talking about football. We're talking about basketball. I mean, it it, it really is a, a fun time because – Kurt Signetti has come in and just turned the program around immediately. And I know we're going to get into what the schedule has been and what it is upcoming and things like that. But look, this team 6-0, and they were the first team in college football to punch their ticket to a bowl game. And we're going to be on the national stage this Saturday. I mean, it doesn't get better than what's happening in Bloomington, Indiana right now. What is the average? I, 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 you know, as uh, as you can see, as um, I'm from Jersey, so I, I'm a Rutgers guy. I also grew up a Michigan fan, so I'm a Big Ten guy, and I, I've watched a lot of Indiana games, and I've watched a lot of Indiana football at that stadium, and uh, it's it's sort of like Rutgers, you know, for the most part. A lot of empty seats, a lot of times, and that's just the way it is. Uh, but has it really caught on before? I mean, what we're going to see this week? Uh, have we seen the uh, the transformation from the fan base yet, or do you think that that officially comes this week? I think you've started to see it slowly but surely, right? And and look, Indiana fans have started to make a pretty big movement of pack out Memorial Stadium, show up and support yeah. this team. I mean, they've added a bunch of new uh, tailgating features and they renovated the stadium and they did a lot of things before this year, talking about the university as a whole. They did a lot this year to make it better anyways. And now that the team is actually performing to the standard that fans deserve to, or I guess the team deserves to have fans there is what I've talked so much about um, on Locked on Hoosiers is, look, these guys are 6-0, and and they're playing really good football. They're a top-20 team in the country. They deserve to have people there. It has started to catch on through the last couple of weeks, but I think this weekend with Nebraska coming to town, what we thought would be a top-25 matchup, it's not, but it's it's close. I mean, it's, it's basically that. Uh, you're going to see the stands very, very full. The first sellout in three or four years in Memorial Stadium. So okay. we're really looking forward to that. You've got the big new kickoff. You've got Barstool is going to be in town. All sorts of folks are going to have their eyes on Bloomington. So, yes, the fans are going to be there this weekend, and I hope that it looks really, really good on the national stage. Yeah, uh, what is their uh, ranking right now? Uh, right now, in the latest AP poll, 16th is what we made it up to. So Okay. Mm -hmm. And what season would be considered the best season for Indiana football? Who? And even if we're just talking about, say, our lifetime or yeah, the there was 30 a, years or so. Yeah, I mean, there was a there was a 10 win, a nine or 10 win season a few years ago, trying to dig in my brain. So, I mean, a couple of years ago, this team actually went on a pretty good run. But the way that this one's starting right now, I mean, oh, it, it, different. yeah, it, yeah, it's completely different. And again, the schedule hasn't been the craziest thing in the world. But in the past, Indiana didn't go out and beat a team like UCLA on the road. They didn't beat Maryland's of the world. They just they didn't do that. And heck, last year it took two or three overtimes to beat FCS programs. Right? Yeah. And so it's it's just the fact that it looks so much different. Even with the few good seasons we've had in the past 10 or 15 years, 
It just looks different because the team is poised. They look talented, both sides of the football. Only one game this year with a turnover. Now, there were two turnovers in that game, but that's the only game this year that they had actual turnovers. And it's just things like that, man, that didn't happen in the past. And that's what makes this one so special right now. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, let's uh, go over the team first and then we'll go over the, then we'll talk about the game. So, uh, so again, as I mentioned, the quarterback situation, and I know uh, Hayden Russell, who does uh, some scouting here at our lads, uh, he is going to talk about Rourke uh, on his next video. He's talking about some uh, kind of sleeper Heisman guys. No, you know, whether or not he becomes a, Heis- a true Heisman contender or not, that's that's maybe another story. But um, he likes talking about sleepers, and so he wants to talk about Rourke. So. Uh, we're going to get into that. And, uh, but when you talk about how much success he had in the Mac is one thing. Uh, you talked about the schedule and, and okay, that definitely has a big part of it, but still, you know, he's completing 73% of his passes with a 14, two ratio and two ninety two a game through the year, which is very impressive. Even if it's not, uh, you know, the top uh, part of the schedule, it's still, it's still not the Mac, um, and it's still uh, at least two uh, Big Ten games, so or three, counting UCLA, of course. So what do you like about Rourke? You, you, it's not like Indiana is a quarterback factory, so he must really just jump off the field when you see this kid play. But what do you – I know you've watched a lot of football, so what is it about Rourke that you like that makes him a difference maker? He's just so – cool and so calm and just he just nothing gets by him and nothing overwhelms him nothing gets him flustered I mean he's just goes through the motions every single day in practice that we've seen and heard from and then every Saturday that we've seen him on the field it's just another day another game for Curtis Rourke he's out there balling doing his thing and he was a I don't want to say an unknown commodity in Ohio, but there weren't a ton of programs jumping on the guy. And Indiana and Kurt Signetti said, come on with me. We'll take you. You're the best thing we got. And so that's exactly what Indiana did. And that's what jumps out to me is that he's just he's just a calm, confident quarterback. He's extremely smart. He makes the right decisions. He's not going to blow you away with throwing it 70 yards down the field or throw it Patrick Mahomes style. But he's going to make the right decisions. You mentioned a 14 to 2 ratio. Both of those picks were in the same game. Other than that, he's played near perfect football. And even in that game, he responded very, very well. And he's been able to rely on Justice Ellison and Tyson Lawton, his running backs that are behind him, to re- and, you know, rely on them and use them when needed. Indiana, I think, is a run first team and play heavy okay. defense. But Curtis Rourke, when they call his name, He makes and delivers, and that's what you love to see about him. He just flat out executes, and Indiana hasn't had a guy like that in quite some time. There have been some very exciting players that have played the quarterback spot here, but the consistency was a big factor. That is what Curtis Rourke brings. You know what you're getting every Saturday, and through six games, he's bringing a lot of wins. So did they have to? Uh, I mean, I can't. I can't imagine. Maybe I'm wrong because I know the basketball program is is, is uh, you know, I know there's no comparison. But as far as NIL, was there was Rourke like the main guy? Did they have to put up a little bit of money to get him? Or like you said, I know he wasn't like the biggest name on the market, but still, I mean, I, I know at Rutgers we would, we'd sure love to have him. So what is it about Indiana that uh, that worked out. Was it money? Was it uh, was it the coach? What was it? I think those everything that you just said is a combination. I think it was a fact of yes, Indiana's NIL situation has gotten better, uh, especially on the football side. I think you've seen, as I mentioned earlier, the university has done a really good job in investing in the football program. They just updated the practice facility coming into this season. So brand new practice field, you know, covered and all that type of stuff. So new facilities are working. They were worked on and they're still being worked on here in Bloomington. Plus, yeah, I I don't know the exact amount that Curtis Rourke received, but I do think NIL played a part. But also think that it was, hey, 
Here is a power four D1 school with a new head coach that's made really good quarterbacks during his time with Kurt Signetti, who wants me right away and will play me right away. And I think all of that just came into the decision of, yeah, this is a no-brainer. Let's leave Ohio. Let's go next door and play at Indiana and be the guy. And I think Kurt Signetti told him that I'm going to bring some dudes with me that can play around you on the offensive line, behind you in the backfield, guys to throw the football to, and he's found those. And this offense is rolling, and I think all of that played a huge part and saying, hey, let's take a chance and let's go play at a big-time program. And for Curtis Rourke and for Indiana, it's worked out so far. Yeah, I, there were still a lot of uh, a lot of uh, players that came back and there were a lot of uh, players with starting experience. So it wasn't like, even though there was a change with, with some, some, some talent in the coaching staff, it's not like a lot of these kids are young. And like I said, uh, you know, there's, they're, they're, they're guys who need some experience. This is a team that's a lot more experienced than people think. And the team is a lot more experienced than people think. So talk about, you mentioned the running game situation. You got a couple of seniors in Ellison and Lawton. Ellison seems to be the big, big uh, dog, statistically speaking. Uh, is that the case? Is he, is he, or is this a kind of a committee that, you know, a one, two punch? I think it's a one-two punch. I really do. I mean, yeah, Ellison's typically your go-to guy, but you feel very comfortable with Lawton back there as well. And thankfully, we haven't dealt with a ton of injuries with that yet. But if something were to happen, you feel good with the other guy, I think is where Indiana stands. And so that's very rare to see in college football, especially now with NIL and transfer portal. It's like, okay, if you're not number one, guys just jump ship and go find somewhere else. But um, in terms of of Ellison and, and Lawton, I think it is a one-two punch. I think you feel good no matter who's got the football in their hands. And even if they don't have it in their hands, they know what to do, whether it be run blocking or going out for a, a, a pass or whether it's just running around or doing whatever the case may be that they're asked to do they execute extremely well. Same thing for the receivers. That's what makes this whole thing go so smoothly is everybody just does their job, and it starts in that running back room with a one-two punch of those guys. Yeah, and a lot of people thought that Black uh, uh, was going to be uh, – I mean, he was going to be in that mix. Not saying he's not, uh, but he hasn't produced like the other guys, uh, a James Madison transfer, but Surratt – the receiver from James Madison has taken the bull by the horns and been a big part of the passing game. Uh, and, and again, this is what I love about the transfer portal. Everything of what you see here at Indiana is what I think is great about the transfer portal because two or three years ago, this is not happening. Even if Signetti gets the job, it's still not happening. He ha He's not bringing all these guys over. He can't. Or, or if he brings them over, they're going to have to wait. Right. Uh, so it's just not happening. So the, the, the ability to, to, to not only bring the coach over, but the coach to bring some of his players over, boy, that a combination um, really has been a boost. So talk about Surratt, uh, because both Surratt and Cooper, by the way, I mean, not only are, are, are they producing, but they're producing with a really high uh, downfield average. So th these aren't guys that are averaging 12 or 13 a catch. They're averaging like between 17 and 20 a catch. Yeah, big play guys is what they are. And Indiana doesn't take a ton of shots, but when they do, those two guys hear their name and numbers called. And Surratt has been the go-to guy. I think he's got, what, like 150 yards more, give or take, on, on the year. And he's the go-to, but you feel good with Cooper as well. Same way we just talked about Ellison and Lawton, it's kind of the same way. Whichever guy you call upon, it's like, hey, I'm going to put it in a spot. Rourke has proven this. I'm going to put it in a spot where you can make a play and go make it. And more times than not, they do. Very, very few miscommunications with Rourke and the receivers, very few mistakes in route running and, and not knowing the play. And, and look, all of those things happen just about everywhere in college football, especially with transfers or young guys or a new combination of quarterback, receiver, running back, offensive line. I mean, those are just things that happen every single season at a new program. And I don't know how. <laughs> I have no idea. I guess credit to the guys and the coaching staff. But Indiana just has very few of those mental breakdowns, lack of communication, just 
pure mistakes. And I think it's to what you spoke to earlier. There's a lot of seasoned dudes that have played a lot of college football. And when you get a lot of those guys in the same room, even if it hasn't been together, they just click automatically. And I think that's what's happening with Rourke, his receivers like Surratt, and the guys behind him like Ellison and Lawton. And it's working out very, very well for Indiana, who is one of the highest scoring offenses in the Big Ten. Yeah, I mean, overall in the nation, they're fourth in total offense, second in scoring at 47-5. Defense, which we'll get into uh, just a bit, is also producing. Who would have thought that at Indiana? But then again, I mean, Allen was a defensive guy, but sixth overall in defense, 11th in scoring, and sixth against the rush. So uh, it, it's not just 6-0 uh, and oh and a quarterback. It's everything. Uh, offense, defense. Uh, couple of guys also, before we move over to the defense, that uh, are not statistically having big years, but McCulley, um, what's up there? Is that is, is that just a surprise? It's just there are guys now that are just in the pecking order, have taken over, and that's why he's not producing statistically like he did last year. And then Horton, the tight, uh, the tight end, also a transfer coming over. Um He's a guy that is not – I know he's a first-team SBC, but I'm, I'm, I'm imagining he's first-team SBC because he's more of a well-rounded tight end. It really just comes down to there's only so many – plays in a game right I mean there's only so yeah. many there's only so much time and to think about this college football now with the new clock rules and everything teams are averaging less possessions per game this year than we've seen in decades because of all the running clock and and just averaging less possessions and so there are less plays and I I think that has a lot to do with it I really really do because those are talented guys but when you have people in front of them that are producing, why do you go away from them? And I don't think it was a strategy of, hey, let's not get them the football. But early on through six games, Signetti and this entire staff, they said, hey, we've got this guy, we have this guy, and we know they're going to produce and do these things that we asked them to do. And so far it's worked. And so there are guys you could say that on the defensive side too, what we thought were going to be good and or have more of an impact i'm not going to say they're not good but at least sure. have more of an impact and that just hasn't been the case now could that come back to bite us if again hopefully not but if somebody gets injured or yeah. if teams figure out how to defend certain guys yeah it absolutely could but i think for now it's the system's not broken so we're not going to fix it until i guess we absolutely have to Okay, so uh, one more, and that's the offensive line. Uh, you can't produce this uh, well offensively if the offensive line is not uh, doing their job. Um, is there is there a particular standout on the line, or are they pretty much just doing it, uh, you know, as a group? As a group, honestly, I, I mean, and I know that's the easier answer, but it really is true because the run blocking has been so so good when needed. But the biggest thing is Curtis Rourke has time. We've seen for years and years and years and years here in Bloomington, pretty good quarterbacks have come through here. They just get sacked like crazy. They have no time. They're running for their lives. They just don't have time to do anything. And that's part of the reason, as you were asking me about Curtis Rourke, why he is so calm and just so composed in the pocket he has no stress. He has no worry on him. Nobody's getting to him. And, I mean, he's been sacked a handful of times, but he's been able to do whatever he wants back there, and it's across the board. Center, guards, tackles, they do exactly what they do. And I mentioned the running backs earlier blocking as well. When they're called upon, everybody's on a string. Everybody works together. There's been a little injury problems in there here and there, but okay. even the guys that have stepped into, it, it's been flawless. And so Curtis Rourke, I hope, he, uh, I hope he's given those guys a watch or something for Christmas because they've done a phenomenal job for him this year. Okay, now on defense – uh, cor correct me if I'm wrong. There are five JMU uh, uh, all accolade performers that came over. I believe are that's all correct, five yeah. of them contributing? Uh, for the most part, I'd have to double check and look into exact you know snap counts and stuff. But for sure. the most part, yes, yeah. Okay. Is there anyone that is contributing more than the other? Because I see, well, Kamara. He leads the team in uh, tackles for loss and sacks. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, you've got James Carpenter. You have uh, Jalen Walker. Uh, Fisher, he leads the team in tackles. Yeah. And then also Pons. 
yeah. uh, is there as well. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> who knows where this Indiana defense would be without these guys. Well, I think Aiden Fisher and D'Angelo Pons are the two guys that you have to talk about when you okay. start talking this Indiana defense. Fisher, the linebacker, Pons in the secondary. Those two are your go-to. Fisher, I mean, Fisher could play, I personally believe, he could be playing linebacker at anywhere in the country. I, I think okay. he's that good. I think he's that talented. Leading tackler, fills the gap. And I love the linebacker spot. It's my favorite position on the defense in college football, high, or any level of football, really, because they are the quarterback of the defense, right? They are the communicators. They are the ones who make the plays and, and call the plays and make the checks. And for most college teams, and Aiden Fisher is in this boat as well, I believe, He's the one that wears the green dot on the back of his helmet, right, for the communication on defense. And so that is a huge factor because the coaches are talking to him, right? He's making the different changes and things like that. And so I love Aiden Fisher. And then D'Angelo Pines started a little slower this year, but has gotten back to true form. And, and people are afraid to throw his way because he's just that dangerous. So between... Uh, Aiden Fisher, linebacker, and D'Angelo Pons in, in terms of your corner. I mean, you've got those two layers covered. Been up shifting around of the defensive line a little bit, but overall it's been effective enough. And Indiana has played well enough on defense to win football games, and it helps when they have something to defend. The fact that the offense is scoring – Quite a yeah. few points. They have something to defend. They have confidence when they step out there. Rather than what we've seen in the past, you look up and you're like, oh, we're down 14 nothing. Yeah. That's great. And yeah. you just lose all confidence. Jacob Goins joining us here uh, from the Locked On Hoosier podcast as we turn our attention to the game this week, the big game against Nebraska. And I, I got to tell you, I was a little bit surprised to see Indiana was a seven-point favorite. As much as I'm all on with this, obviously I wouldn't have you on if I didn't believe in everything going on here. Um, and a lot of people believe what's going on in Nebraska too. Uh, you know, rules been there for a couple of years. You, you knew he was going to fix it. You know, once he, he, you know, once he had that, that team going for a year or so, you just knew that eventually things would click and he's got a, a highly touted young quarterback. Um, uh, I guess when I look at this game, what I the reason why I was the reason why I'm a little bit surprised that the line was seven is because I'm thinking that my guess is is that well you know Nebraska didn't look all that great against Rutgers and uh, you know you, you just get and 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 yeah they they struggled a little bit of course with Illinois and and all that stuff and Indiana is just off to this tremendous start and they haven't what every game that they've won has been by fourteen or more points and and all this stuff but like you said you you tipped it off with the schedule this is now an upgrade in the schedule this is going to be the toughest team that they played this season and as good as Indiana's defense has played. I don't think yet, I'm not sure yet that I, I, I'd put them up there, even though, again, I think a lot of it does have to do with the fact of who they played. But um, do, or do they have the defense to rattle, uh, you know, a freshman quarterback? I don't know. I mean, I actually think this is a game that I would I would look at more as more on the offensive side, more like a 27-21 game or, or something like that than a 14-7 type affair, which is what Nebraska was in a couple of weeks ago. So, um, anyway, I, look, I think it's going to be a really good game. Obviously, I think Indiana can win the game, but uh, I just I get the feeling it is going to be a war. I get the feeling this is going to be Indiana's test, and this is going to be the one that they're going to have to fight and claw to the end. And I'm so glad that it's at home in Bloomington, right? Because, look, I'd be nervous to go to Nebraska. That's a tough place to play. Now, it's an early kickoff, and I've always said – the road team in conference games has the advantage in early kickoffs. So this is a test, not just for Indiana's team, but you and I were talking earlier about the fan base, right? This is a huge opportunity for Indiana fans to show up and prove that they want to support a football team and a football program because if yeah. that stadium's 70% full at kickoff, right, big new kickoff on Fox, that's an advantage to Nebraska, a huge advantage to them. And I'm with you. I think this is more of an offensive game. I think Indiana's defense can play, as I said earlier, play good enough. They're not going to stop Nebraska every time. You can't. They're too explosive. They're too electric. And the quarterback, he, he he's awesome. And, and Indiana's not going to stop him every time. 
But what you have to try to do is stop Rayola just enough. Just enough. Enough times to give your offense enough times to score as well. And in terms of somebody being under pressure and not being rattled, to this point, I'm betting on Curtis Rourke before I do on the other side. And so can this offense continue to prove how explosive they are, how methodical they are, because that's the thing. It's just long drive after long drive, running and throwing and first down after first down. That's what the Hoosiers have to do. By far the toughest test to this point in the season. If you win this one, though, here's the schedule. You ready? I know you've seen this. Washington, winnable game. Michigan State, winnable game. Michigan here in Bloomington, winnable game. We don't have to talk about the game in Columbus. And then Purdue, right? Like, that's a very, very winnable schedule. But I promise you, Indiana's not overlooking Nebraska. Kurt Signetti will have them ready. This should be a doozy on Saturday afternoon. Yeah, because this is the type of game that could decide. And again, you talked about the schedule. And and, and I know maybe I shouldn't be going, looking ahead and all that kind of stuff. But the fact is, you just talked about a schedule that, yeah, there's no Penn State. There's no Oregon. Uh, there, there's three elite teams in the Big Ten, and two of them are not on the schedule. Uh, and I'm not counting Michigan. I'm a Michigan fan. They're just not elite this year, right? So, and like you said, Indiana gets them at home. So that that's why this is a really important game, as you mentioned, because hey, if Indiana is going to be as good as and, and and fulfill their their utmost potential, how do we know? that they can't be there all the way till the end fighting potentially for something like a Big Ten championship game. It's possible. Very possible. And and it's crazy to say Big Ten championship. You start floating around college football playoff and things like that. I mean, as of right now, it is legitimate and it is possible. But the back half of the season, we're going to find out. Here's the thing I'll say on this game Saturday Both teams coming off a bye week. That's a huge factor here. We haven't seen Indiana come off a bye week yet with Kurt Signetti. I'm really looking forward to it. Everything is in front of this team. How they play this Saturday, we're going to learn a lot. And here's the stat, uh, speaking of bye. And and look, this is not Signetti. This is just a program. Uh, The Hoosiers are 0-6 against the spread with rest when they take on an opponent off a straight-up win. So... Uh, that might work against them. And Nebraska's 9-2-1 against the spread. Their last 12 was a road dog. So this is a that? good spot uh, for Nebraska. Look, I like Nebraska in the points, uh, but I, I, I still kind of feel that Indiana is just a little bit better right now. And the reason I believe that, I think Nebraska's got a, I think Nebraska's got a little bit kind of different defense, very physical defense. And and I'm I don't know I might side with Nebraska's defense, but the big difference here is as good as the both quarterbacks are, huge difference. You got a senior quarterback against two freshmen. That yep. is a huge difference in a big game down at the wire. That's uh, another reason why if it's a close game, which I I think it's going to be, you kind of alluded to it before. You kind of got to favor Indiana in that spot. I do, and I'm I'm with you. I think Nebraska keeps it close, but Indiana, I just think as a more disciplined, better coached team, I'm going to take the Hoosiers to win this game. It's going to be back and forth, and if again, if we win, everything's in front of us. The <laughs> schedule lays out for things to happen in Bloomington. I'm really excited about what Saturday could hold as everybody will be watching Indiana and Nebraska. Yeah, looking forward to it. And Jacob, I uh, just want to uh, let everybody know out there who uh, is watching as an Indiana fan, talk about the uh, Locked On Hoosiers podcast because you do it daily, correct? That's right. Yeah, every single day, man. I appreciate you letting me do that. Yeah, Monday through Friday, Locked On Hoosiers, your daily Indiana Hoosiers podcast. Whether you're on audio, you can find the video version on YouTube. It's free and available to you every single day in the morning. Make it your first watch or your first listen every single day. Just search Locked On Hoosiers on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, and I'll make sure to put a link in the description of this video so you can check it out, uh, as well as a way to find you uh, over on Twitter. So uh, X, uh, whichever way you want to call it. But anyway, Jacob, I appreciate it. I'm glad we were finally able to do this and best of luck because if Indiana does get this win, uh, that puts them uh, in, in, like we said, in really good shape. And maybe uh, we'll be able to have a really good conversation again uh, later on this year 
uh, especially if it means that uh, they may have a shot uh, at uh, sniffing, just sniffing even the possibility of a Big Ten championship game. That's right, man. I really do appreciate you having me on and looking forward to the back half of this Indiana football season. Thanks, Jacob.